So we are here today doing some Q&A. Yeah, we're ready to go. So Q questions. Welcome to the Ask Linux Academy show. My name is Christoph Limpler, and in this show, we want to answer your questions. So if you use the hashtag Ask Linux Academy on Twitter, we will see your questions and pick a handful of them every single week. Then we'll pick one of our course authors who's knowledgeable in that area, and we'll get you your answers. Make sure you follow at linuxacademy.com on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. That way you'll be able to see what kinds of topics we are picking that week. And then you can submit your questions again at the hashtag Ask Linux Academy Show. That way we can see them. Hello everyone. My name is Davis Engler and I'm here today to read off the questions. I've got a list here on my phone of about 12 different questions that Johnny received from the community to have answered today. So what we'll do is I'll read off the question, we'll bounce back to Johnny and hear his answer. I've got several multi-part questions, but I'll just read those off individually as separate questions. So our first one comes from Fran. He says, Johnny, as a serverless expert, do you use any serverless technology in your day-to-day -day that's been coded by yourself? For example, is there any web service, bot, or something similar that you've coded yourself to use serverless technology? Fran, thank you for your question. All right, so in my day-to-day -day function, I actually do get to use serverless technology. So I'll give you an example, and I think it's a pretty cool one, actually. So I also get to work not only as a course author, but I get to sometimes consult with some of our development teams here at Linux Academy. And so if you're familiar with our new public beta of cloud assessments, um, one of the features that it has in it is actually the grading engine. And so the grading engine has run on traditional servers and the team thought that maybe there was an opportunity here for us to utilize some serverless technologies in order to save some money, have better efficiency, and um, you know be able to scale it a bit more. And so, so I was tasked with creating a proof of concept of actually using Node.js to execute some bash that ends up running a Ruby runtime-based application. And so, uh, so in my day-to-day, -day, yeah, I do get to build some serverless functions or handlers and whatnot. And, uh, and some of that gets moved into production. And so I was ex really excited to work on that one. And uh, it was a pretty cool project. All right, Fran actually has another one for us. He says that he's always reading about how good serverless services are uh, with things like AWS Lambda. But Johnny, he's asking what you don't like about serverless. Fran, thanks for your second question. All right, so fortunately, because I'm not an AWS sales guy or I don't represent one of the cloud service providers, I get to tell you what's good and bad about serverless. And so. Uh, one of the things that I mention in my serverless concepts course, and I'm not sure if you've gone through that, is not only the benefits, but also some of the caveats. And one of those caveats is that the tooling around serverless technology is somewhat immature right now. So if I'm answering the question, what do I not like about it? It's actually some of the current tooling around managing all of the serverless components. If you're developing something of you know, moderate complexity, it can be challenging for your team to manage all of those components. And there's some, some tools and frameworks out there that try to address this, but those tools are still somewhat immature right now. And um, there's a lot of opportunity for maturity and growth in that area right now. All right, we have one last one here from Fran. He says, related to his last question, did you face any situation where you could have used a serverless technology, but you prefer to use a more traditional approach? And if so, why exactly? Yeah, sure. So to answer this one, I can give you an example from a project that I worked on. So in terms of uh, now, you know, in order to answer this question, you could say that it depends on um, the complexity of your project, the kind of technical debt that you have. But in my example, um, we were actually using a SQL database and that was already provisioned. We had a lot of data inside of that. 
And so rather than migrating that to something like DynamoDB uh, and having to write a bunch of MapReduce jobs, we decided to write um, API gateway endpoints and Lambda handlers that would interact with an RDS instance running Postgres. And so uh, that allowed us to um, to get some of the ad hoc queries and some of the analytics features uh, that you know a traditional SQL database would give you with ease, as opposed to some of the additional complexity that comes with having to write MapReduce jobs to get somewhat similar answers. Awesome. Thanks for the questions, Fran. This next one comes from Harrison. He's got a personal question, he says. How cool are your office neighbors? Why is your cubicle row the greatest cubicle row? Yeah, so for that question, I'm not sure that I can answer that one because I'm not sure what part is a row versus a column based on where I'm sitting right now. So in short, all of my cube neighbors are pretty amazing. All right, our next one is from Thomas on LinkedIn. He says, okay, Linux Academy, let's start with some tough questions. Number one, this is a multi-part. Number one, how would you define serverless? What services would you identify as serverless? Sure. And actually, this is something that I mentioned in serverless concepts. So if you haven't checked that out, you can go to serverlessacademy.com. But in order to answer the question, what is serverless, I first normally say, you know, does serverless mean no servers? The answer is no, there are still servers involved. The thing that makes serverless different is that developers and operators don't have to think about servers anymore as part of their concerns. That's offloaded to one of the cloud service providers or CSPs. And so uh, in terms of what makes something serverless, well, serverless you can find in two camps. One is called FAS, which is function as a service, and the other one is BAS, which is backend as a, as a service. And so in terms of what services are available as either FAS or BAS, so things like AWS Lambda, that's a function as a service solution. You know, things like Azure Functions, Google Cloud Functions, IBM Bluemix OpenWhisk, those are all in the BAS camp. Now, in terms of the BAS camp, really the major player there is uh, Google Firebase. And for a long time, Parse was also part of that, but uh, Parse ended up getting acquired by Facebook and they ended up open sourcing Parse to the public. And so, Parse doesn't run as a separate organization that is a service uh, anymore. It's kind of up to you to, to implement. And so those are uh, some, of the, some, of the, uh, some of the service options that are available under serverless. All right, we've got another part from Thomas. He says, have you ever participated in creating or provided a production ready, full blown enterprise solution that utilizes API gateway and Lambda? If so, can you please share your experience? So yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. There was a cool project that I was a part of in late 2016, where we were able to implement a front end that was uh, built with web technologies, specifically React. And then also uh, later we ended up using Swift for an iOS native app in terms of the front end. And the app ended up being the primary vehicle that orchestrated uh, d talking to our back end. And the back end was created with Lambda functions that, that handled user authentication through Google Identity Provider. And, um, and so we were able to utilize uh, API Gateway for a lot of the functionality endpoints, Lambda itself for the logic, and then um, DynamoDB for a lot of our data components. Thomas is really hitting us with the questions and I'm liking it. All right, his next one. What would be your preferable way of managing all those separate Lambda functions in a production-ready project? Like serverless framework, Shep framework, CloudFormation, AWS, or some other solution? Great. So. For me right now, my preference is using something that AWS announced at reInvent in 2016, and that is something called AWS Serverless Application Model, or AWS SAM. And they have a cute little logo, it's a squirrel. But, uh, but it's an extension to CloudFormation that allows you to basically um, express your serverless application components, whether it's API gateway endpoints, Lambda handlers, DynamoDB tables. And so it allows you 
to create a stack that deploys all of those different components. And so that makes it a lot easier for you to manage all the disparate parts as long as you deploy the stack to, together as a cohesive whole. We're still with Thomas here. What are your thoughts on testing serverless solutions? Do you think TDD or BDD would be possible someday using those? Sure, and actually I would say that you can do testing today already. So depending on your programming language, you'll be able to pick up some of your existing unit testing frameworks or test runners, whether it is TDD or BDD based, as long as you know the, the runtime is supported by Lambda or you can do uh, something creative that ends up calling another runtime as well inside of Lambda. But um, I mean, I would recommend that you plug into some kind of uh, continuous integration system still that runs tests before you end up shipping your handlers out to, uh, out to production. But in terms of the experience of testing and doing local testing, uh, there's some, some great opportunities to use the tools that you're already familiar with. Um, so like if you're using Node.js, you can use, you know, uh, Mocha and Chai, uh, or, you know, you could use Ava um, in that JavaScript world. Um, and so uh, if you're looking for a way to even implement a serverless CI tool, there's a tool out there called Lamb CI. And, uh, and so uh, that, should, that should also help you out by running those tests every time you're committing uh, code into your repository. Okay, Johnny, how would you compare AWS serverless solutions to those provided by their competitors like Google and Firebase? Sure. So what I would say is that AWS right now is the market leader. You know, they, in terms of function as a service, they've been one of the first products on the market. And so the other cloud service providers are trying to play catch up. But some of the other cloud service providers have been able to innovate, um, such as so Azure Functions, they were one of the first to release uh, a serverless application system where they could run on the .NET runtime. Well, at reInvent 2016, AWS announced that Lambda now supports the .NET Core uh, runtime. And so, um, so you know, they're, they're kind of trying to be neck and neck, but I would say that, uh, that AWS certainly has the, um, has the leg up on the competition right now. Johnny, how would you implement user authentication using the API gateway in Lambda? Or would you outsource it? And if so, how? In terms of this question, I think that the answer is it depends on what your specific requirements are. What I would say is, you know, it's it's probably a good idea to first start with a third party, so something like Auth0, um, and you could go ahead and get a OAuth2 implementation from them, you know, and then plug that into your front end of your application, and so, um, you know, you can offload that. But if you want to implement user authentication and authorization yourself, you definitely can utilizing API Gateway and, uh, and Lambda to integrate with other identity providers such as Google or Twitter. Um, or you end up implementing your own where you can create a custom authorizer Lambda and plug that into API Gateway. And so it'll run that Lambda before um, it actually runs the Lambda that executes your logic. So let's say you hit an endpoint. It'll, it'll check the authorization header, make sure that all of that stuff succeeds. If it does, it'll pass it on to the actual Lambda handler that executes the function that the, um, that the endpoint was meant to to represent. So, um, so that's how I would go about doing it if I had to manually implement um, user auth. All right, now we're on the last question for Thomas. Is Linux Academy or maybe even Cloud Assessments planning to provide more serverless courses, especially those regarding non-AWS products and production-ready hands-on implementation examples? I would say absolutely. So we've definitely heard from our community a desire for a more comprehensive look at utilizing serverless technology in new projects and also within existing projects in an enterprise setting as well as for startups. And so 
you're gonna start to see more content get released where we implement some projects uh, utilizing you know, AWS, Azure Functions, you know, it, maybe even Google Cloud Compute if they ever come out of beta, but you know, Google's not necessarily pressured on that kind of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, you should definitely see some new content pretty soon. In our final question for the episode, we have one from Devondra. Would we have an integration course for DevOps for all of the tools used? For example, Git, and then Jenkins, and then Docker, and then Chef, similar to setting up an entire infrastructure from scratch. I'm not sure that I can totally answer that, but I get your sentiment. We have some really great courses that tackle those technologies all in isolation, and it would be absolutely great if we could see some kind of course that brings it all together to provide a cohesive, comprehensive you know, understanding of how all those pieces come together. Sort of like an integrations course. Um, and so I'm gonna take your feedback and I'm gonna pass it back to the guys that make the decisions. And, uh, and hopefully we can, uh, we can put that on the, on the drawing board and get that going. So thanks for your question.